I am Sebastian. Today we are going to discuss about protein turnover. Protein turnover means it is the lifespan of a protein from its synthesis to its degradation. What is going to be the learning objective of these sessions? We shall look at in the basic concept of a, a protein turnover. What is the logic involved in the protein turnover? We will elaborate on this topic. Then we will look at uh, what is the machinery required. Okay, is the machinery required for protein turnover? Then we will look at uh, the exact process. The exact process of protein turnover. So these are going to be the three major learning objective of these sessions. So let us begin with the, the, the process of protein turnover. So the process of protein turnover is we will look at what is the basic logic involved in the protein turnover. Let us consider a human being with about 70 kilograms of weight. So here is a human being with a 70 kilo weight. Remember this weight was acquired over a period of time. When you are born, you are only about 3.5 kilos. Over a period of time, one has acquired this much of weight. Now, in this person, roughly about day-to-day -day intake, so intake is about 100 grams of proteins on an average. And in this person, roughly about, let us say, the how much is degraded every day? It's about 400 grams of protein is degraded per day. Out of these 400 grams, roughly about the amount which is synthesized is also about 400 grams. So 400 grams is synthesized and 400 grams are degraded. Which means if the total amino acid pool of an individual of 70 kilo weight per day is about 500 grams. This is the total amino acid pool. From this 500 grams of amino acid pool, roughly we have seen that about 400 grams is reutilized for synthesizing newer proteins, which means we are left with 100 grams of amino acid or protein, which is totally catabolized, degraded and excreted. So this is the uh, giving you a brief idea about the total amino acid pool and how this the whole process of this turnover which is happening in every individual. We need to understand that if the turnover is not constant, which means we have all kinds of proteins in our body and the turnover is not constant. Look at the type of proteins that we have. So there are many proteins which are, you know, uh, ex which are synthesized and excreted to the extracellular side. Look at enzymes, look at hormones, look at antibodies. So these are synthesized and excreted. Now these proteins relatively will have a short half-life. Half-life is a term to denote that the time required for the total quantity of the protein to be half. Therefore, these proteins, these are set of proteins that will have a very short half-life. Digestive enzymes, etc. In the second category is um, there are proteins which are part of the structural components. Structural components like collagen. These proteins are not degraded very easily. They will take time. If the T half of collagen is roughly about 1000 days, you can understand now very well that if there is a scar on your skin, it will roughly take about two and a half to three years to get rid of that scar if it is a deep scar. 
That is because new collagen has to be synthesized. The old collagen has to be removed. So the half-life is very, very long. Now look at the third category. Third category is the proteins which are related to regulations, which means, you know, the enzymes, the intracellular enzymes, which are regulated. So these must be degraded fast. If these are not degraded fast, regulation cannot be very effective in intracellularly. So therefore, these must be regulated fast. Now there is a fourth category, category D, that is these are proteins, they are not destroyed very fast, they will remain for a pretty long time. For example, you look at the cytochrome C, cytochrome C, it is not, turn, turnover is not very fast. Look at the hemoglobin for that matter. The globin gets turned over only about 100 and days later. So therefore they will be degraded much slowly. So the main point is the degradation is not constant. That is the point that we need to learn. A second aspect that we need to understand is, let us call this point number one, point number two. The second aspect is there are several other factors affecting the degradation. One possibility can be either pH or the temperature of the system. By and large, our body, the pH and the temperature might remain more or less the same. Not much fluctuation happens. This may not be so much of an aspect in our case. The second case in this is, uh, uh, you look at uh, the uh, individual, certain individual proteins they may degrade depending on the location. For example, you look at LDH. Now LDH, you know it is an isoenzyme. It is present in heart, in muscle, in liver. If it is present in heart, heart, if the half-life of LDH is about 1.6 days. If it is present in, in uh, uh, liver, if the half-life is somewhere around 16 days. You see, depending on the enzyme, it is changing in the half-life. If it is present in muscle, it is about 31 days. Remember, it is the same enzyme. And the same enzyme, an isoenzyme, depending on the location, if the half-life of the protein also changes. And the last point that we need to keep in mind, it's about in the nutritional status. Nutritional status of an enzyme. For example, you take um, an enzyme called acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Acetyl-CoA carboxylase has a lifespan of uh, uh, somewhere around, you know, uh, 40, 45 hours. If it is in a fed state, if the function of acetyl-CoA carboxylase is to convert acetyl-CoA to malonyl-CoA so that it helps in synthesizing palmitic acid, fatty acid synthesis. So in a well-fed state, if the half-life of this acetyl-CoA carboxylase is roughly about 45 hours. In a starving situation, you know there should not be any fatty acid synthesis taking place. Therefore, in a starving situation, if the half-life of acetyl-CoA carboxylase is roughly about 18 hours, the enzyme should not be there. It has to be degraded. You see that there are varieties of factors that is affecting the degradation of an enzyme or a protein. At this point of time, you may be wondering why there has to be a protein turnover? Isn't it a wastage of energy? So the question is why there is a protein turnover? The primary reason for a protein turnover is please understand that a protein is constantly under stress. It can be an environmental stress or it can be a stress which is felt from within. 
one of the most important thing that happens stress protein is a reactive oxygen species the reactive oxygen species will have a stress on every protein in its conformation in its catalytic activity and in its structure so reactive oxygen species becomes the biggest threat to a protein let us understand that proteins have very very limited capacity for self repairing so self repairing for a protein is very very minimal in this context we cannot handle we cannot manage with a mutated protein therefore degradation of a protein is a very effective way of quality control so remember quality control is a very essential thing and within intracellularly quality control is maintained by degrading the proteins that are wrongly folded or that are not active let us look at uh, how this is achieved now for example when a protein is getting folded you can understand what all damage can occur to a protein for example let us understand that uh, uh, a protein is here is the ribosome okay this is the mrna the protein is being made when the protein is being made and this is happening in the cytoplasm assume this is the uh, endoplasmic reticulum this is the endoplasmic reticulum now as the protein is being made now in the the, in the things that can happen to this protein the things that can happen to this protein first of all in the hydrophobic sites can be exposed patches of hydrophobic region can be exposed to the watery environment that will damage the protein if the second possibility is if the disulfide the cysteine residues that may be exposed that are not able to form disulfide linkages and giving stability to proteins another possibility a third possibility can be uh, incomplete glycosylation incomplete glycosylation and that results into aggregations so these are some of the things that will happen to a protein therefore as the protein is being synthesized the endoplasmic reticulum is going to ask the question is there incomplete glycosylation that is a question are the hydrophobic sites exposed are the disulfide bonds available this is the question that will be asked if the answer to this question is yes if the answer is yes that is a protein that has to be folded properly and it is led to its function so therefore this protein is transported to the vesicles to golgi bodies and and it is transported that is if it is folded properly if every criteria is met suppose the answer to this is no there is no proper glycosylation hydrophobic regions are exposed disulfide bonds are not available if the answer is no this is a protein that should not be there in the system such proteins are brought out of the endoplasmic reticulum a uh, molecular chaperones will take up okay they will take it up and then they are degraded these are degraded and degraded to amino acid and these proteins are not becoming part of our day to day living system so you see that a very effective quality control mechanism is operational in our body that is the beauty of the the regulatory mechanism i also understand 30% of the proteins that are synthesized in the body are folded wrongly they will undergo this kind of uh, uh, degradative mechanism 
So effectively, we are trying to understand that there is a very, very effective mechanism in having a quality control. Also remember that all this process involves uh, ATP requirements. Hydrolysis is an energy requiring process. When it is an energy requiring process, it is not happening random. There is a direction, there is a purpose. That is the point, point to be noted here. Another important aspect of protein turnover is, it is, uh, it is the way a cell respond to an altered environment. Okay, to an altered environment responds to Okay, in the way a cell responds to an altered environment. Look at a classic example of bacteria. A bacteria, before it undergoes sporulation, spore formation, what will happen is a lot of degradation of a lot of proteins occurs. And the amino acids derived from these proteins are utilized for production of those proteins that are needed for spore formation. See the important aspect of it. So we have, so what now this comes to a question. What happens if a protein is not degraded? If a protein is not degraded, that will result into its accumulation in the cell. That will result into, uh, you know, it can also cause uh, uh, vitalization. It can cause cell death, damage to a cell. It can cause uh, uh, degeneration of uh, tissues, it can be muscles, it can be liver. All these problems are associated with the improper degradation of a protein. Effectively, we are seeing that degradation of protein has got uh, several points to be noted. Number one, it will help in uh, help in you know providing amino acid so therefore it provides amino acid for synthesizing new protein so it provides amino acid point number two is it helps in degrading damaged proteins that is the second point and number three point number three is very important that is selective degradation of a protein Selective degradation of a protein is very crucial for apoptosis. This is a concept which is coming up that is being discovered that selective degradation of a protein is very important for apoptosis. We also see therefore there is a positive element in selective degradation of protein. Selective degradation of a protein is assisting in uh, you know in the activation of certain enzymes so it is involved in uh, uh, chromatin remodeling it is involved in uh, tissue differentiation it is involved in uh, activation of enzymes it is involved in, in uh, 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 maintenance of the circadian rhythm so it has got a varieties of functions especially in maintaining life so what we have seen so far is we are looking at uh, what is why there is, what is protein degradation why there has to be protein degra degradation and what are the positive as well as the negative aspects of a protein degradation from whatever research has been carried out